If there is a child near you, would you just lay your hands on them right now? I believe the Lord is imparting gifts and callings. I believe the Lord is doing a supernatural work in this house right now. In the name of Jesus. Paul told the young man Timothy, stir up the gift which was given to thee by the laying on of my hands. Why don't you speak it over them and into them right now? In the name of Jesus. 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 In the name of Jesus, in the name of Jesus. Praise God, praise God. Why don't you give our children a hand today? We love them so very, very much. Praise God. As they're returning to their seats, I do want to give honor and double honor to our leadership, my district superintendent, my general superintendent, I give honor to this great children's ministry department and the great brother Steve Cannon. <laughs> what a great team they have, brother Knox and brother Sharon. I give honor to their one million soul revival vision. We honor that tonight and I give honor to brother and sister Marshall, the Bible quizzing family, the great job that they are doing. Give honor to my wife today. I love her very much. And my children, Sydney and Simon and Jance. And to the beloved saints of Eureka and Humboldt County, the staff members that are here today. And all of my friends, I feel like the richest man in the world. Thank you for all of your kind texts and encouraging messages. And it's such an honor of mine to stand and preach to our friends, our children, and our parents. I do believe that God has something very, very special for us today. I believe that our children are going to leave empowered and transformed by the Holy Ghost. I pray, I pray in the Holy Ghost today that something would be ignited in their spirits and they will never, ever be the same again. I want to be a voice by the help of the Lord to those who have no voice. On behalf of our children, I'm going to challenge our parents and talk about the great things that God has for them. But I do want to say, in an audience this vast, I do understand that there are many that perhaps have walked away from the Lord, your children. The retention rate, the statistics are alarming, up to 75% have walked away from their apostolic Christian roots. But as David walked back to a city that was burned out, as he viewed Ziglag, he received a promise from the Lord when all of his family was gone. God's promise was, you're going to recover all. By the authority of the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I tell you, they are but one prayer away from complete spiritual restoration. And before the coming of the Lord, we're going to see a mighty harvest of prodigals coming back. I give you the prophecy of Isaiah. He said, I'll bring thy seed from the east. I'll gather them from the west. I will say to the north, give up. And to the south, keep not back. Bring my sons from afar and from my daughters from the ends of the world. If he can do that for natural Israel, how much more is he going to do for the body of Christ, uh, for his body? Uh, they've been blood bought. They have the name of Jesus. They're part of the eternal covenant, and we claim them in the name of Jesus. <laughs> to the book of Mark chapter number 11. Verse number 2, Mark chapter 11, and verse number 2. And Jesus saith unto them, Go your way into the village over against you, and as soon as ye have entered into it, ye shall find a colt tied, wherein never a man is set. Loose that colt and bring him to me. Verse 3, And if any man say unto you, Why do you do this? 
Say ye that the Lord hath need of him, and straightway ye will send him thither. You may be seated. When this great event took place, known as the triumphal entry, it was the fulfillment of Zechariah chapter number 9 and verse number 9. It was prophesied some 500 years previous. Zechariah 9 and 9 says it this way. Rejoice greatly, O daughters of Zion. Shout, O daughters of Jerusalem. And they did on that day, saying, Hosanna to God in the highest. Hosanna, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Behold, your king is coming to you. And he did that. He is just and he's having salvation. Notice the last phrase of that verse. Lowly and riding on a donkey. But it was not just any donkey. The Bible tells us it was on a colt, the foal of a donkey. When Jesus spoke of this colt to his disciples, referring to it as a colt simply referred to something that is innocent and young and naive. Foal is another word that we just read from Zechariah. By definition, a foal is from a baby to one year, uh, years of age. Jesus said upon this colt, no man has ever sat or no man has ever ridden. Jesus said of this colt, I need him. If anybody asks you what you're doing, simply tell them the master has need of him. I have come to preach to this great church today that the Lord sees every colt. He sees where it's tied, he knows what it's doing, and he knows the plan that he has for it. When it came time for Jesus to, to fulfill a 500-year-old prophecy, he did not ride on a royal stallion. He did not ride on something that was experienced, but he chose to fulfill prophetic destiny by riding on a colt that had never been ridden before. Could it be? In this house today, God is trying to release the young children that are in the house uh, to come back to this world one more time. It was on wobbly legs that he came back. It was upon the young, no experience and zero confidence. But God said, I'm looking for a colt. I have need of a colt. To every child that is here today, the Lord needs you. To every child that is here today, your world is fixing to change. Going forward, the hand of the Lord is upon you. And God is interested in you. Please consider with me, it was a cult that led him into the fulfillment. It was a cult that carried the supernatural on his back. It was a cult that led him to his destiny. I believe our children need more than punch and cookies and a veggie tail. I believe our children need more than that. In fact, Brother Cannon, it's not just going to be a, th a million soul revival, uh, but there's going to be a million soul army. Uh, it's not just them finding salvation, uh, but it's about them being an apostolic circulation uh, because I believe God wants to do a revival in this last day among our children. Genesis chapter number 22, Abraham's biggest life test was on Mount Moriah. And as he ascended that mountain, he knew he had to sacrifice his promised son. Abraham said, I and the lad will go yonder to worship. Somewhere up that pathway, the Bible tells us that Isaac the lad broke the silence, said, Father, I see the fire, I feel the wood, but where is the sacrifice? Abraham looked at that lad of his and he said, my son, God will provide himself a lamb, a sacrifice. Every generation must teach the next generation the language of faith. That when you don't know where the answer is coming from, you can simply say, my son, God will provide. Pay close attention when they come to the spot where they see the hill afar off. The Bible would tell us that Abraham places 
the wood upon the back of Isaac the lad. That's very important to us because Isaac realized that that lad could carry a load. Isaac realized that the lad had great strength. On the final leg of the journey to the prophetic destiny, it was a lad that carried the load. I believe there are lad and lasses in this house today that can carry an apostolic prophetic load as we enter the final counts before the rapture of the Lord. They are strong enough to carry the wood of sacrifice, willing enough to submit themselves to the altar and submitted enough to the hand of the Father that holds the sacrificial knife. I believe there are lads and lasses in the house today that can carry a burden and can carry a spiritual load. They're bigger than just an iPad stuck in their hand. I believe they can lay hands on the sick. We need to expect it. We need to speak it over them and we need to release it in this last day. The greatest gift is not to shelter them, but it's to empower them, yoke them with an altar and say, go and reach your generation. When we read about Isaac the lad, four chapters later, we find him uh, redigging the wells of his father. It's a wonderful thing because God speaks the promises once again that he spoke to his father Abraham. And Isaac responded to that by doing what he was taught as a child. He built an altar. But then the story and the narrative becomes so riveting because he did something else. He did not just maintain his father's altar. Your Bible said that Isaac dug his own well. Could it be in this house today that we're living among lad and lasses that are not just going to maintain the father's faith of old. Thank God for it. We're not going to abandon it. But we're not just maintaining the past before us today. They're going to dig a well for themselves. A well that's never been dug before. I believe they're going to dig in and tap in to a well that produces rich Rivers of living water never experienced before, never tasted before. They're going to build their own land. Today, there are more children alive than ever before. 27% of the world's population is under the age of 15. To put things in perspective, for every senior citizen, there are three lads alive. When our lads and lasses receive the Holy Ghost, they do not receive a junior version of the Holy Ghost. When they receive the Holy Ghost, they receive the same Holy Ghost uh, that adults receive. You know what that means? Uh, they're anointed for the business of the kingdom of God. They have the same dominion. They have the same authority. That's why the late great apostle Billy Cole would often have a child that would pray for healing in his crusades because he understood the principle of the kingdom of God and children. It was Jesus that said, the greatest in the kingdom is a child. It was Jesus that said, if you want entrance into the kingdom, become like a child. Two of the three people that Jesus raised from the dead were children. When we look at this principle, he wrapped up a child in his arms and in his laps, perhaps knowing he would never have his own child. And he said, if you offend or cause to stumble one of these little ones, it were better that a millstone were hanged about your neck because Jesus is interested in our lads. Tell them the master hath need of them. When we look at lads throughout the Bible, it's an amazing journey to take. It was a lad in his lunch, which was the catalyst to feed 5,000 men and women. In contrary to many artist renditions, the majority of uh, the disciples, uh, many believe, were mere teenagers. In fact, in study just recently and in conversation, uh, I was told that John the Beloved 
was the youngest and perhaps he was as young as 12 to 15 years of age. What are you trying to say? They can do so much more right now. I believe our children can change their world right now. Jesus said, thou hast perfected praise out of the mouth of babes. Not a polished singer, not a polished musician, but he said praise is perfected in the mouth of a child. David said it in the eighth psalm. He said, when a child sings, strength cometh. In the natural world, Mozart composed his first minuet when he was five, his first symphony when he was eight. William James Cities developed a new logarithm when he, about around the number of 12, and he gave a lecture at Harvard when he was eight. That's why I believe that children are, uh, 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 can do so much more. It was a lad that led Samson to a pillar, and he did his final and his greatest miracle. It was a lad, it was a lad's prayer that God responded to when they were kicked out of Abraham's house. Uh, the Bible would tell us Hagar, his mother prayed, but God did not answer. But when the lad under the shrub prayed, God answered and sent the help because God hears the prayer of our lads and lasses. It was a lad, a boy king of eight years of age that he was prophesied 300 years before he was born that he would come and tear down and establish the things of God. And I say, do it again, Jesus. It was just a lass, a young girl by the name of Miriam that could hide in the bushes and bargain with Pharaoh's daughter about her, her brother Moses, the deliverance of him. But when you consider the story, it was so much more than just Moses, her brother. It was the nation of Israel and the line of the Messiah and it all hinged on a young girl that could hide and bargain for the deliverance. It was a little unnamed maiden girl, just a lass of a girl who was typology of a missionary in a far country who one day said to one of the most powerful men, he was the head of the Syrian army, and he, she said, I know where you can go to find healing of your leprosy. Thank God for our lasses. It was a young damsel girl by the name of Rhoda, just a lass, who while they were were in a prayer meeting, uh, discerned the voice of Peter before the prayer warriors. It was a lass of a girl, uh, Rhoda, just a young damsel, uh, that discerned Peter was knocking at the door. Uh, I'm here to tell you they can hear what God is saying to the church. Uh, I'm here to tell them uh, that it's time for them to arise uh, for this hour. Philip the evangelist had four daughters that were all prophetess. When we read Joseph's, uh, the story of Joseph, and we come to the climax of his life, the fulfillment of his dream, your Bible says that Joseph said, unless the lad comes, I will not reveal myself to you, referring to his younger brother Benjamin. Unless the lad comes, Joseph's dream cannot be fulfilled. Unless the lad is part of the story, then Joseph's great prophecy cannot be fleshed out. Could it be your next revival is waiting on your story to include a lad or a lass? We love what Daniel did in Daniel chapter number one. Those four Hebrews in Daniel 1 and 17, it says these four children... God gave them knowledge and skill in all learning and wisdom. And Daniel had understanding in all visions and in all dreams. Do you realize that Daniel chapter number one, those boys were between the ages of 12 and 15 years of age. All wisdom 
12 to 15 years of age. Interpreting dreams, 12 to 15 years of age. I say it again, they're bigger and better than an iPad stuck in their hand. They're called of God for this hour and we as a body need to release them in the apostolic ministry in this last hour. It was the prophet Samuel who anointed David with the king's oil. And David was a mere 10 to 15 years old. A king's anointing and a ruddy face. This young lad played in the king's court because King Saul was tormented by spirits. And David would play the harp until the spirits left. You know what that tells me? David, as a young boy, 10 to 15 years of age, was involved in spiritual warfare. I say when they receive the baptism of the Holy Ghost, they need to know and we need to expect the gifts to operate in our children. There needs to be a shift in the way that we think God's hand is upon them for this hour. I'll just tell you, they're talking in tongues. They're having tongues and interpretation. It's already happening. Young people, young children lay in intercessory prayer. We consider the value of a lad. The Bible boldly, boldly declares it. History depicts it. The Bible promises it. And Satan fears it. So he fights against it. If you remember Judges chapter number six, the enemy, when they encamped around the people of God, did not come to wipe them out as a people, but they came to steal their newly ripened crops. They didn't want to destroy their houses. Uh, they simply wanted their new colts and their new cattle and, and their new calves and their new ripened harvest. And I believe the spirit is no different today at conference. Uh, the enemy doesn't just want to wipe out the church. Uh, he wants our children. He's after our children. It's been the story in the Old Testament and the New Testament alike. Pharaohs and Herods have always been after our children. Could it be the most dangerous place to be in all the world is a child? Watch now. The educational system and agenda is after them. Disney is after them. The government is after them. The Antichrist spirit is after them. Satan in hell is after them. And I know you parents feel the pressure of perilous times, but allow me to reveal the whole picture today. It's not you they're after. You're just interference for their real target. The adversary is after our children. A lady in our church took her four-year-old son to the doctor recently. While they were having an exam, the nurse asked that four-year-old, are you a boy or are you a girl? Mother raised her hand and she said, oh, we don't do that. He knows that he's a boy. And the nurse had the audacity to raise her hand back to that mother and said, I'm not talking to you. I'm talking to your child. Satan has declared all out war against our children. It's the thundering voice of Pharaoh all over again. You can leave Egypt, but leave your children behind. It is Moloch, Chemosh. It was the pagan gods that, that were relevant during the day of God's people. It was an awful scene. That great, that great image, they would place their baby into the hands of that great image. They build a fire within through a system of pulleys uh, that would raise that baby up and throw it into the mouth, uh, into that burning inferno. Uh, and on signal, the drummers would begin to beat the drummers louder and louder. Uh, and as the baby would scream in torment, I present to you today, it's the same spirit, but a little different tactic. The enemy that is alive today does not want your children dead. He wants your children alive. He just wants to control his mind and pervert his spirit. 
and convolute his conscience. And he wants him to be a vessel for his terrible, insidious, devious, sinister lies. What do you preach about this for? Because in California, there are grammar schools where they now have to salute the gay flag. Transgender Barbie dolls are now a thing. Our libraries now are full of drag queens reading to innocent children. They're taking them on catwalks and teaching them how to put money in the waistband of strippers. In some states, they're funding 13-year-old girls to undergo life-changing surgery, reassignment surgery under 13 years of age, complete hysterectomies and mastectomies without parental consent. If God doesn't intervene and if the church doesn't arise and push back and open our mouth and let truth be proclaimed, we'll be another statistic. But I feel the spirit of Nehemiah here today. I'm ready to fight for my family, my wives, our sons, and our God. They are worth fighting for. God needs them for this end time apostolic revival. God cannot destroy them away from your home. He will destroy them in your home, online. Our children are called native, digital natives. They've grown up in a world of electronics from birth and this digital electronic wave is the gateway to pornographic material. Hear me, the average age of being exposed is eight years of age, scarring forever their innocent conscience. But not only is it that, this has also created a spiritually desensitized generation where sin is whitewashed and presented as normal and it's seen in grayscale and evil is called good and holy profane and there is no difference. Just like in the book of Daniel to those four godly young people, the first thing they want to do to do is change their name so they could change their identity. That's why Disney's president, who claims to be the mother of a transgender and pansexual child, said she's planning to incorporate LGBTQIA plus in as many Disney movies as possible. Disney said they have declared they want half of all leading roles to be played by transgender characters. Disney recently released a, 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 a movie called Little Demon. The plot line centers around Satan fathering a child who is a girl, who is the Antichrist. Why are you preaching about this? Because Satan knows the anointing that's upon a child. Satan knows what God wants to do through them. So I appeal, I beg, I plead, and I urge in the Holy Ghost today for a mama and a daddy to rise up and say, I'm gonna protect the anointing on my child for end time revival. I hesitate to mention it, but the horrible story of Uveda school shooting, when a deranged gunman went inside, I refused to call his name. He shot up student and staff. It was horrible. He walked through a, a doorway marked 111, and reports tell us that either that door was propped open or the lock was not functioning properly that he walked through. So I appeal to you precious parents today that God has bequeathed you precious children to raise in the house of God. When we read the story of Hezekiah, it's so moving and so powerful. 
He was so used by God. In fact, he did what 28 other kings before him was too cowardly to do. Uh, he was influential in reestablishing the kingdom. You could say they had a mighty revival. He cleansed and restored the temple. He reinstituted temple sacrifice and Passover. Uh, he reinstated uh, the priesthood. Uh, and they had incredible revival for a time. In fact, God even healed his body miraculously extending his life 15 years. But he did not spend his last 15 years that God granted him very wisely. Why do you say that, preacher? I'll tell you why. Because during those 15 years, he made the greatest mistake of his life. Uh, the Bible would tell us that he opened up his house uh, to the enemy. And the enemy came inside. And when the prophet Isaiah heard about it, he immediately countered back and asked him a question. Uh, he said, Hezekiah, tell me. What did they see in your house? And Hezekiah said, well, they saw everything. I showed them my treasure. To which he responded, Isaiah said, because they were allowed in your house and saw your treasures and possessions, they're going to come, and I quote, all that is in thine house shall be carried away to Babylon. Nothing shall be left. Their sons and their daughters shall be taken away and shall be eunuchs in the palace of Babylon. Watch what Hezekiah responds. 2 Kings 20 and 19. Then said Hezekiah unto Isaiah, good is the word of the Lord which thou hast spoken. And he said, is it not good if peace and truth be in my days? You see, Hezekiah was only worried about peace while he was alive. No thought about the next generation. Hezekiah just wanted to get through life and have revival in his day, uh, but not worry about the future of his children. Uh, he got tired of pushing back against the enemy. Uh, it's one thing, Hezekiah, to have revival in your day. Uh, it's one thing to have it, uh, but you've got to have a revival within mind for the next generation. Uh, I don't want just peace in my day. I want peace in the next generation. So we've got to be willing to stand in the gap. It was said to Gad, Gad, your fathers did not follow me wholly. And because of that, you follow the domino effect. You have the land of the Gadarenes. And to the parents that did not wholly follow the Lord, the Bible tells us that the demonic was in that country and the tormented was in that country. The uncommitted generation will always produce an unclean generation. What is tolerated occasionally will be done continually and the effects of compromise are not seen to the next generation. Come with me to the book of Nehemiah chapter 13, verse number 23. And in those days also, the Jews that married wives of Ashdod, Am, and, and of Moab, and of their children, their, their, their children spake half of the speech of Ashdod and could not speak in the Jews language but according to the language of each people something stirs in my heart allow me to express the burden of the Lord that he put upon me today the apostolic future is what we're fighting for moms and dads it's been said we're one generation away from extinction and handing our lads and lasses a defaulty a half baked in the middle version of what was given to us is not an option. Allow me to say a few years ago, we took our children to a cat park. It was so fun, big cats and lions. During the course of that tour, my young boy got disinterested in the lady talking about the cats. And he went down to the ground, started playing with sticks. He was unaware of his surroundings. Uh, but that king of the peace lion, I watched him. He was behind a, a log there partially uh, and he locked on to my son probably because he was the youngest of the group. Uh, nothing would move but the eyes back and forth on my child's movement uh, and in one blinding flash, uh, he lurched his body from behind that fallen log uh, and 
compounded with incredible agility and incredible pounds, gobbling up space. And he launched his body towards my son. And there was a, just a chain link fence that he smashed into, running full force. On that day, the only thing that saved my son from the lion was a fence. And so to all of my apostolic peers today, thank you for loving your children enough to build a fence between the lions of this world and your lad and lasses. I salute you for being fence builders, that the beauty of holiness is still right. Separation from from the world so we can be separated unto him in real time. Relationship, long uncut hair uh, is still a signal to the spirit world. Uh, there's still power and authority, modesty, shamefacedness is still loved by heaven. Uh, and when you have his spirit, when you have his goods on the inside, you don't need it on the outside. But this is conference. Why are we preaching like this at conference? Because Jesus was lost in a conference. They supposed that he was with his mom and dad. But the Bible would tell us that while they made their annual pilgrimage to their conference, that Jesus was lost in the crowd. And I know if we're not careful, uh, we can get so involved in ministry that we lose the importance of our number one ministry and that is our family. Moses, uh, Noah was intentional. He built an ark for the saving of his family. Uh, the richest person in this house, I promise you, hear me, it's going to be when you get to heaven and your baby comes up, uh, freckled face, uh, and grabs you around the leg uh, and say, thank you, mommy and daddy, for helping me get here. Could it be that your family needs you more than your friends need you? More than your ministry needs you? More than your fans need you? Your family is your greatest treasure, not your ministry, not your ministry success. Uh, perhaps your greatest accomplishment will not be what you do in the kingdom, but who you raise to do something great in the kingdom. So back to our text. When Matthew writes of the triumphal entry, he gives a little different detail than Mark that we first began to read about. Mark's rendition tells us it was absolutely a cult that brought in the supernatural. But Matthew chapter 21 in verse two tells us, go into the village opposite you and immediately you'll find a donkey tied and her colt with her. Loose them and bring them to me. Verse seven, they brought the donkey and the colt. They laid their clothes on the donkey and the colt alike. No doubt that was a beautiful imagery that they carried the same look I present to you, the same mantle of anointing as they came into town. But that colt that was wobbly, laid, inexperienced, did not just do it by herself. She did it only because there was her mama walking alongside of her. I believe that mama was walking alongside of that colt talking to her the whole time. The mama's presence was reassuring to that young colt that day. It was simply saying, honey, it's gonna be okay. I know that feels awkward carrying that weight, but it's gonna be okay. I know you're gonna have to go in the direction that it tells you to go. And you're gonna get tired sometimes, but you're carrying the weight of glory. It's going to be okay. You see that mama had to encourage that child and say you're carrying the supernatural. 
I believe that mama donkey looked and said, you're fulfilling prophecy, baby. You're carrying the anointing. You're bringing Jesus to your world. I believe there are young colts in this house today that are going to bring the anointing of God to this world. But they need a parent that walks with them beside them. Brother Aaron Bounds told me a story the other day that so moved me. He was 10 years old in his bedroom. He was praying, he was crying at 10 years of age. And he said, God, I want to be used like you used Moses and Aaron in the Bible. I want you to speak to me like you spoke to David. While he was praying, he didn't even hear his father enter the room. He said, I felt two hands scoop me up and pull me close. Say, Aaron... What's God talking to you about? And he began to rock and pray for his son. And it was just a few days after that that Brother Aaron Bounds preached his first message. And now he's a thundering voice of the apostolic uh, spirit uh, that goes around. Thank you, uh, Brother Bounds Sr., for leading your child and helping Jesus carry Brother Landon Gore, the fiery evangelist, was only eight years old while he was in church. By a, a, he tells the story that he began to feel the spirit of the Lord and he just opened his mouth and he began to talk about it and, and it just became more forceful. His mother, Sister Gore, recognized it and she reached down as Brother Landon was just praying and she sensed the gifts were trying to operate and she simply put a hand on his back and raised him to his feet and at eight years of age he gave his first message of tongues and interpretation and the rest is history in Brother Landon's life. I remember being in Rome on a family vacation we were in underneath the platform of the basilica where supposedly Peter's bones are. It was an incredible tour and the people that were with us were so emotional and they were just weeping uncontrollably. And I remember in our tour group there was a father there, a priest that was with us and he stood, stood forward at that moment. He identified himself and he said, I would like to lead this group in the Lord's Prayer. And he did as much. But standing next to me and my children was their granddaddy, Steve Wilson. And I'll never forget what Brother Steve Wilson did. In that moment of time, he spoke up and he said this. Allow me to remind you what Peter's first message was on the day of Pentecost. And he began to quote Acts 2 and 38. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized. And about that time my children joined in with the rest of Acts 2 and 38. And he showed them that day how to be a world changer. I remember the first devil that I was involved in casting out. I was 15 years old and we were in my living room. It was a, a game night in the youth department. The process of that, I don't remember exactly if it started with the prayer meeting, but that spirit started acting out. That young man had a tattoo of a snake that had a half of his forearm that was burned away and out of that burn mark there came this snake. I remember that because while we were praying for him and he was convulsing and speaking all kinds of uh, 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 different words out of his boy, body with different voice, he would claw his arm until it was all bloody. And he would reach up, grab his hair, and he actually pulled out handfuls of hair. He stuck it in his mouth. He chewed it up. I was standing right in front of him, and I was saying, I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And he took that mouthful of hair and spit it all over me. 
I didn't back up not because I was anything spiritual, not because I was super authoritative in the spirit, but I didn't back up because my dad was standing right next to me and I knew there was no way that devil could come against my dad. I, I felt so bold, so courageous. I, I just kept saying in the name of Jesus, come out. In the name of Jesus, I bind you. And in a matter of moments, it happened. Come on, moms and dads. The the Lord needs your lad, but you've got to walk with them to Jesus. I hasten an adult salmon that we love to catch and eat will be born and travel around the world. Three to five years later, it will come back to the exact stream in which it was born. And that female will lay her eggs and then die. She will give her life just like her mother did for her to perpetuate the next generation. History is rich of parents that will do it in the natural. They'll sell everything in hopes that their child will win a gold medal. They'll give up careers and houses and lands and move to a foreign remote place, all in the chance that they'll have a gold medal someday. In fact, Tiger Woods' mom and dad took a second on their house when he was 14 years of age in hope that he would make a junior tournament and just perhaps he had talent enough. They bet their farm on a maybe and they said tiger we believe in your ability I would to God today if they could do it for the gold of this world there would be a mom and daddy that would say I'll bet the farm on what God has got for you I'll bet everything I'll make decisions because the hand of God is upon Hannah, Hannah brought that baby back to the Lord and the very place it was birthed in the spirit made full circle back to her prayer spot because Hannah prioritized her son being involved in the kingdom and be given back to God. She invested time and resources in making him a godly priestly garment that mirrored the priest of his day. She was involved in his future. Hear me. I don't mean to be mean. If my spirit is wrong, please forgive me. I'm just trying to give you what the Lord put in my spirit. If we can get him to little league practice and band practice, but we don't have time to take him to prayer meeting and move the mission and Sunday school rallies. We're not interested in the next generation. It's got to be the focal point of every decision in life. The music team can come. It was Samson's nameless mother. She was simply the wife of Manoah. The Bible said that the word of the Lord came to her, that she lived by a different vow while Samuel was still in her belly. Watch now. It said you can't drink any a thing, any fruit of the vine. You cannot touch anything deadly because you're carrying something and the decisions you make affect the next generation. When we look at this, it's amazing because her decisions prepared the way for the next, it had nothing to do with her and it had everything to do with the next generation. It had nothing to do, she lived differently so that her son could have a different anointing. And I hear the voice of the Spirit tonight that is saying, the time is now for our young children to step forward in apostolic ministry. I don't think we need to go by ourselves. The Bible said, I and the lad will go yonder and worship. This is a joint venture here tonight. I've come to tell you don't feel sorry for your child being born in this last day church that's fighting the antichrist you need to be honored that God called you to parent this apostolic generation he knew Daniel could handle the lion's den he knew David could handle Goliath he knew Esther
pastor can handle Haman and he knows your child can handle Disney and handle the Antichrist spirit of this last day. So the Lord said, tell your child I have need of you. If there's a child next to you, I just want you to reach down and tell them right now, the Lord has need of you. If there's a child around you today, I want you to reach down and tell them, God wants to use you to carry the supernatural. Tell that child that when they pray, things can happen. Tell that child God's called him to be used in the gifts of the Spirit, the working of miracles, and to be a thunderous voice in this last day. The Lord needs our lads. Just think once with me what would happen if they would be released in this last day. If you would care enough to say you know what I want to bring my child not only to receive the Holy Ghost but to put them and release the word of faith in fact I present to this great church today if you're sick in your body we're going to have children lay our hands on you in just a moment and I believe everything that the scripture taught us can be put into practice today I believe that children are the greatest in the kingdom of God and they can pray over emotional situations. They can pray over physical healings and you can be made whole this night. So it said, the Lord needs your lad. Tell him I have need of you. And that mama lad, they both came together. Is there a mama or daddy that will grab your lad now by the hand and bring them up around the front and come believing that God has something for them? Would you grab those precious children today? They're not, they're not just worthy of an iPad. They're worthy of a word from God. If Daniel could interpret dreams at 12, what could we unlock in this house today? you grab that child and come around the front to Jesus we're going to have some young people come and pray here they're going to release the word of faith that God would bless them would you just lift your voice and begin to pray we'll allow them would you lift your voice and just reach out to heaven right now moms and dads you may not have a physical son you may have a spiritual son and daughter we're going to bring our lads to the Lord. God, I believe that every child in this room will be filled with your soul, with the Holy Ghost, God, with the fire of God will fall upon them, and they will be a vessel for your spirit. They will be a vessel for your anointing, God. The anointing will flow off of them, God, and they will be a warrior for you, God. There will be an army that rises up and binds and casts out every spirit that comes against the church. In the name of Jesus, every spirit of fear, every spirit of anxiety, every spirit of depression, every spirit of transgender, Every spirit, Jesus, I cast it out. I bind it in Jesus' name. Jesus, God, I pray for every single person in this room right now that they would receive your spirit, God. I pray that every devil would be bind out of this room right now, Jesus. I pray that everyone my age, Jesus, God, will receive a calling for you, Jesus, in Jesus' name. Jesus, I pray for any, for all the children, Jesus, I pray that our future generation doesn't get down by the depression, Jesus, I don't, I pray any demons that come into their children's life, Jesus, I cast it out right now, Jesus, oh God, I love you, Jesus. Beginning, God, yes. the devil has been against this church. 
children has been against this generation because he knows that there's something in the children. There's a faith in the children that is nothing like nothing else. They tried to kill them in Egypt and they're trying to kill them now. But God knows that there's future pastors right here. There's future ministers right here. Missionaries and soul winners are in this church right now. I pray, God, there has been David who got up and faced that giant. They have gotten up and stood up for their God, and we will do it now in Jesus' name. In the mighty name of Jesus, I declare victory over every single demon in this room. I declare victory and authority, God, and I pray all right now, God, that you would put that authority on every tongue in this place tonight, God. Over every parent, God, that has been fighting demons, God. Every single spirit, God. I pray, oh God, Lord, Lord, that those spirits will be cast out, God, at their schools, God. Cut off the head, oh God, of those spirits, God, that influence our children, God, that influence us at school, God. Lord God, give us strength to fight back against the darkness, God no power and they will never have power for God you are the one and only God you are Alpha and Omega the beginning and the ending the author of our faith and the finisher of our faith and there is nothing that you cannot do Lord God so I ask God you give us the strength and the courage to fight back against the darkness God and the spirits and the demons that come before us God for we have the power God that was manifested in flesh God 2,000 years ago God and I declare it right now in the mighty name of Jesus God over the UPCI God the anointing that's the anointing it's covering this house today come on young people reach out and claim it it's for you today that's the Holy Ghost you feel that's what anointing feels like 